Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I am Dr. Vijay Sagar, Professor and Head, Department of Anatomy at the Sri Ramachandra Medical College and Research Institute in Chennai. Today, we will be dealing with the hip joint. A look at the clinical anatomy of the hip joint. The hip joint is a weight-bearing joint and is prone to osteoarthritis. Dislocations can occur in the hip joint which could be both congenital or traumatic. Traumatic fractures can occur. The fractures are usually due to osteoporosis. There is a delicate vascularity to the head of the femur and this could result in avascular necrosis of the head of femur. Hip replacement surgery is a common procedure which is being undertaken these days. We will discuss this topic under the following headings. We will first have a look at the type of joint which is formed, the bones which form the articulation, the capsule and the synovial membranes, the ligaments of the hip joint, the relations of the hip joint, the nerve supply, movements and finally the applied aspects of the hip joint. Coming to the gross anatomy of the hip joint, the hip joint is a multi-axial ball and socket type of synovial joint. Two bones form the articulation. The articulated pelvis shows an outer cup-shaped area called as the acetabulum. This acetabulum is formed by contributions from the pubis, the ilium and the ischium. If you look closely inside the acetabulum, there is a horseshoe shaped area which is smooth in nature. This area is called as the lunate surface. Within the lunate surface, there is a roughened area which is called as the acetabular fossa. Now if you look at the acetabulum, the acetabulum is deficient in the lower part and this part is called as the acetabular notch. The acetabular notch is bridged by a ligament which is called as the transverse acetabular ligament. So this is the upper end of the articulation which is formed by the acetabulum of the hip bone. The lower end of the articulation is formed by the upper end of the femur that is the head of the femur. If you look on the anterior aspect, this is the head of the femur. This is the smooth articular surface which articulates with the articular surface in the acetabulum. This is the neck of the femur. This is the greater trochanter and this is the lesser trochanter. A line extends from the greater trochanter till the lesser, lesser trochanter on the anterior aspect and this is called as the intertrochanteric line. On the posterior aspect, a thickened ridge extends from the greater trochanter till the lesser trochanter and this is called as the intertrochanteric crest. So as we just, just now saw on the articulating bones, the acetabulum of the hip bone is formed by the contributions from all the three bones namely the pubis, the ilium and the ischium. There is a Y-shaped tri triradiate cartilage which joins all the three bones in the acetabulum and that cartilage fuses by around 12 to 20 years of age. The articular surface is formed by the lunate surface which, is, which forms three-fourths of a circle. The non-articular area is the acetabular fossa and the acetabular notch. The acetabulum is deficient in the lower part and forms the acetabular notch and the acetabular notch is, gives attachment to the transverse acetabular ligament. The lower end of the articulation is formed by the head of the femur which is a ball which is, which is comprised of two-thirds of a sphere. The articular surface is covered by articular cartilage and there is a fovea or a depression on the head which gives attachment to the ligament of the head of femur which is also called as ligamentum teres femoris. Now coming to the various ligaments which form the hip joint, we will discuss the ligaments under the following heads. The capsular ligament or the capsule with the synovial membrane, the acetabular labrum, the transverse acetabular ligament, the ligament of the head of the femur. These are fairly small ligaments, the transverse acetabular ligament and the ligament of the head of the femur. The big ligaments include the iliofemoral ligament, the pubofemoral ligament 
and the ischiofibular ligament. Now it is very important to remember that this joint is reinforced anteriorly by strong ligaments and the ligament is reinforced posteriorly by strong muscles. We will see these relations when we come to the relations of the hip joint later in the lesson. So let us now start with the capsule of the hip joint. The capsule is a strong fibrous structure which holds both the bones together. If you see this particular picture, this is the capsule extending from the acetabular rim to the neck of the femur. The proximal attachment is to the outer surface of the acetabular margin and the acetabular labrum and blends with the transverse acetabular ligament at the acetabular notch. This is the upper attachment of the capsule which is attached all along the acetabular margin and lower down it extends onto the transverse acetabular ligament. Distally, the capsule is attached anteriorly to the intertrochantric line on a line extending from the greater trochanter to a little above and in front of the lesser trochanter. Posteriorly, the capsular attachment runs 1 cm medial and parallel to the intertrochantric crest. What you have to remember here is that the neck of the femur is fully intracapsular on the anterior aspect, but the neck of the femur is intracapsular only in the medial part on the posterior aspect. The lateral aspect of the neck of the femur is extracapsular on the posterior aspect. Now the capsule extends from its attachment, it extends onto the neck as fine strands which are called as retinacular fibers. So the capsular attachment is here, from here the capsule extends along the neck as fine fibers both anteriorly and posteriorly and these fine fibers of the capsule extending onto the neck are called as the retinacular fibers. The fibers of the capsule are arranged in two sets. There is an outer longitudinal set of fibers and the inner circular fibers. The capsular fibers are taut in extension and unspiraled in flexion. When taut, the capsule and the ligaments pull the head of the femur deeper into the socket. Zona orbicularis is a special name given to the circular fibers which are located within the capsule. These circular fibers give an hourglass appearance to the capsule that is the capsule is thickened at the outer and the peripheral par parts and in the central part it is narrowed due to the presence of the inner circular fibers. Next we come to the synovial membrane. As you know the synovial membrane lines the inside of the joint capsule and it is not present over the articular surfaces. If you see this particular picture, this stipple line shows the synovial membrane which is lining the inner aspect of the fibrous capsule and the, fib the synovial membrane is not present over the articular surfaces. The synovial membrane contains synoviocytes which secrete a thin watery fluid which is necessary for joint lubrication. According to the hypothesis of weeping lubrication, the synovial fluid is held within the articular cartilage and squeezed out as and when it is required. The synovial membrane if you see also gives out a small sleeve which extends over the ligament of the head of the femur. So this is the lining, inner lining of the capsule which is formed by the synovial membrane. The synovial membrane is giving out an extension along the ligament of the head of the femur and the synovial membrane essentially contains synoviocytes which secrete a thin watery fluid called the synovial fluid which is necessary for lubrication of the joint. Coming to the next ligament is the acetabular labrum. The acetabular labrum is a thin fibrocartilaginous rim which is located within the joint capsular attachment. It is triangular in cross section. The base is attached to the acetabular margin inside the line of attachment of the capsule. The acetabular labrum is deficient in the region of the acetabular notch and the main function of this ligament is that it clasps the margin of the femoral head and retains it within the joint capsule. So that is about the acetabular labrum. We next come to the other ligament, the transverse acetabular ligament which extends across the acetabular notch. It represents the lower part of the labrum without the cartilage cells and gives attachment at its base to the triangular ligament of the head of the femur. So if you look in this particular picture, 
The transverse acetabular ligament extends across the acetabular notch and the transverse acetabular ligament gives attachment to a triangular ligament called the ligament of the head of the femur. The ligament of the head of the femur, as we have discussed just now, is ensheathed by the synovial membrane. The ligament of the head of the femur is also called as ligamentum teres femoris. It is a triangular ligament. The base is attached to the transverse acetabular ligament and the apex is attached to the fovea on the head of the femur. The transverse acetabular ligament gives attachment to this ligament of the head of the femur and the ligament of the head of the femur is covered by a sleeve of synovial membrane. It is very important to remember that the branch of the obturator artery runs in the synovial sleeve and provides blood supply to the head of the femur. This is the branch of the obturator artery which is running along the synovial sleeve and providing blood supply to the head of the femur. We now come to the three big ligaments, the iliofemoral ligament, the pubofemoral ligament and the ischiofemoral ligament. The iliofemoral ligament is also called as the ligament of Bigelow and it is one of the strongest ligaments of the body. It is an inverted Y-shaped ligament which has medial and lateral limbs. It is attached from the anterior inferior iliac spine and divides into two limbs, a medial limb and a lateral limb. The medial limb is attached to the lower part of the intertrochantric line while the lateral limb is attached to the upper part of the intertrochantric line. The iliofemoral ligament reinforces the anterior part of the joint capsule and its main function is it prevents the backward tilting of the pelvis in the erect posture and prevents hyperextension at the hip joint. The iliofemoral ligament is attached to the anterior inferior iliac spine and extends downwards as two limbs, a medial limb which is attached to the lower part of the intertrochantric line and a lateral limb which is attached to the upper part of the intertrochantric line. The main function of the iliofemoral ligament is that it prevents the backward tilting of the pelvis because the line of gravity passes behind the hip joint. There is a tendency for the hip bone to rotate backwards and the iliofemoral ligament prevents the backward rotation of the head of the hip bone on the femur. It also prevents hyperextension at the hip joint. The next ligament is the pubofemoral ligament. The pubofemoral ligament is a triangular ligament which is attached to the iliopubic eminence and the obturator crest. It blends antero inferiorly with the joint capsule and reinforces the antero inferior aspect of the joint capsule. The pubofemoral ligament prevents excessive abduction and extension at the hip joint. We come to the next ligament which is the ischiofemoral ligament and it is the weakest of the three ligaments. It is attached to the ischium close to the acetabular margin. The fibers pass upwards and laterally and blend into the zona orbicularis. The ischiofemoral ligament limits extension at the hip joint. So to summarize what we have studied so far, we have seen that the hip joint is a multi-axial ball and socket variety of joint. The articulating bones include the acetabulum of the hip and the head of the femur. We have seen that the capsule is attached to the acetabulum above and to the neck of the femur below. We have seen that the anterior part of the neck is fully intracapsular while the posterior part of the neck only the medial part of it is within the capsule. We have seen the synovial membrane which lines the inside of the joint capsule and synovial membrane is not present over the articulating surfaces. We have studied the acetabular labrum. We have seen the transverse ligament of the acetabulum which extends across the acetabular notch. We have also seen the ligament of the head of the femur which originates from the transverse ligament of the acetabulum and is attached to the fovea on the head of the femur. We have seen the three important ligaments namely the iliofemoral ligament, the pubofemoral ligament and the ischiofemoral ligament and we have also seen their important functions. The iliofemoral ligament prevents excessive extension. The pubofemoral ligament limits excessive extension and abduction and the ischiofemoral ligament limits extension. Now let us study the relations of the hip joint. The anterior aspect of the hip joint is related to the pectineus, the psoas, the iliacus, the femoral artery, the femoral vein and the femoral nerve. 
The superior part of the hip joint is related to the rectus femoris, the tensor fascia lata, the gluteus minimus and the gluteus medius. As we had studied in the earlier part of the lesson, the anterior aspect of the hip joint is reinforced by ligaments and the posterior aspect of the hip joint is reinforced by strong muscles. Let us have a look at the strong muscles which form the posterior relation of the hip joint. These include the gluteus maximus, the pyriformis, the obturator internus with the two jamili, the quadratus femoris. The sciatic nerve and the nerve to obturator internus are also related to the posterior aspect of the hip joint. On the inferior aspect of the hip joint are the obturator externus and the branches of the medial circumflex femoral artery. So, these are the important relations of the hip joint. Now, let us have a look at the blood supply to the hip joint. The blood supply to the hip joint is from the trochanteric anastomosis which is made up of branches from the medial and lateral circumflex femoral arteries, the superior gluteal artery and the inferior gluteal artery. Now, if you look at this particular picture, this is the femoral artery which gives rise to the lateral circumflex and the medial circumflex femoral arteries. The lateral circumflex femoral artery runs laterally and divides into three branches, an ascending branch, a transverse branch and a descending branch. The ascending branch gives out these fine branches which are called as the branches to the neck of the femur. This ascending branch of the lateral circumflex femoral artery, anastomosis with the medial circumflex femoral artery which is coming out from the posterior aspect and both of them give these branches which run obliquely in the synovial retinacula which are extensions of the fibrous capsule and dip down obliquely into the neck of the femur and supply the neck of the femur and some amount of blood goes to the head of the femur. The head of the femur is also supplied with blood from a branch of the obturator artery which is running in the synovial sleeve for the ligament of the head of the femur. So, the neck of the, neck of the femur receives blood supply from mostly the medial circumflex femoral artery and some branches come from the lateral circumflex femoral artery and the head of the femur is supplemented with blood with a branch which is coming in from the obturator artery which runs in the synovial sleeve for the ligament of the head of the femur. This is another picture showing the circumflex femoral arteries. The most of the, the majority of the blood from the circumflex femoral comes from the medial circumflex femoral artery and this is the branch from the obturator artery running along with the ligament of the head of the femur. This is a picture showing the branch from the obturator artery which is providing blood to the head of the femur. Coming to the nerve supply, I am sure all of you are familiar with the Hilton's law which states that a nerve which is crossing the joint gives a branch to the joint and another to the skin which is overlying the joint. So, which are the nerves which cross the hip joint? You have the femoral nerve which crosses the hip joint and the anterior aspect the sciatic nerve which crosses the hip joint on the posterior aspect, the obturator nerve and the nerve to obturator internus, all of them give articular branches which supply the capsule of the hip joint which carry sensations of proprioception from the joint capsule and sensations of distension and stretching of the joint capsule. So, that is about the nerve supply of the hip joint. We now come to the important movements of the hip joint. The movements of the hip joint include flexion and extension. Flexion occurs around an axis which is around the neck of the femur. The thigh is brought close to the anterior abdominal wall. This is the movement of flexion. The extension is the backward movement of the thigh and it is a 10 to 20 degrees beyond the line of the trunk. The extension as we had studied earlier is limited by the tension in the iliofemoral ligament and the pubofemoral ligament and all ligaments are maximally spiraled and taut in extension. It is important to remember that the extensors of the hip joint are more powerful than the flexors of the hip joint. The next set of movements which occur at the hip joint include adduction and abduction. Adduction is movement of the thigh towards the midline and abduction is movement of the thigh away from the midline. The axis is an antero posterior axis which passes through the center of the head of the femur. Adduction is limited by meeting of the opposite thigh 
and abduction is a more pronounced movement. The range of abduction is directly proportional to the neck shaft angle. The third set of movements which occur at the hip joint include medial rotation and lateral rotation. Lateral rotation is one in which the toe is rotated outwards and medial rotation is one in which the toe is rotated inwards. The lateral rotators are more powerful than the medial rotators and the axis is a vertical axis which passes through the center of the head and the lateral condyle of the femur when the foot is on the ground and when the foot is off the ground the axis can pass through any part of the foot. So that is the three sets of movements which occur at the hip joint namely flexion and extension, abduction and adduction, medial rotation and lateral rotation. We have seen that the extensors are more powerful as compared to the flexors. We have also seen that the lateral rotators are more powerful than the medial rotators. Now we will see the various muscle groups and movements which occur at the hip joint. This is a picture of the hip joint and the muscles which are on the anterior aspect are the flexors. These include the psoas, the iliacus, the sartorius, pectineus and the rectus femoris. Gracilis, adductor longus, adductor brevis and part of adductor magnus are primarily adductors but they also help in flexion. The extensors are placed on the posterior aspect and these include the gluteus maximus, the ham part of adductor magnus, the hamstrings which include the semitendinosus, the semimembranosus and the long head of biceps femoris. Deeper to the extensors are placed the lateral rotators which include the obturator externus, the obturator internus, the superior and the inferior jamulus, the quadratus femoris, the pyriformis and the gluteus maximus. On the antero superior part of the hip joint are placed the medial rotators which include the anterior part of gluteus medius and minimus and the tensor fascia lata. The posterior superior aspect and the superior aspect of the hip joint are related to the abductors which are the same muscles gluteus medius, gluteus minimus and tensor fascia lata. If you compare these two muscles, the anterior parts of gluteus medius and minimus and tensor fascia lata cause medial rotation and the same muscles also cause abduction at the hip joint. Which brings us to the muscles on the antero inferior aspect. These include the adductors which include the adductor longus, the adductor brevis, the adductor magnus, gracilis, pectineus and the obturator externus. So these are the relations of the hip joint and the muscle groups and the movements which are caused by these muscles. Now we come to the applied anatomy of the hip joint. The first clinical entity we will see is the dislocation of the hip joint in which the head of the femur dislocates out of the acetabulum. Now congenital dislocation of the hip joint occurs in 1.5 out of every 1000 live births and it is especially common in females and it results in inability to abduct the thigh. The affected limb appears shorter and the individuals have a typical waddling gait because of weak abductors. Traumatic dislocations can also occur as in dashboard injuries when the hip is flexed, adducted and medially rotated. The force of impact is transmitted along the hip, along the thigh bone and the, as it, the head of the femur dislocates out of the cavity that is the acetabular socket and lies on the lateral aspect of the ilium. The anterior dislocation is a fairly rare condition and occurs in severe hyperextension injuries typically what is called as a Squeers injury and the joint is in the opposite state that is the joint is extended, abducted and laterally rotated. The head of the femur lies below the acetabulum. Look at the two differences. When there is a posterior dislocation, the hip joint is flexed, adducted and medially rotated. The head of the femur lies on the lateral aspect of the femur. In an anterior dislocation, the position is just the opposite. The joint is extended, abducted and laterally rotated and the head of the femur lies below the acetabulum. Now Trendlenburg test is a test which is used to test the integrity of the abductors.
When the abductors contract on one side with the foot fixed on the ground, the opposite leg is lifted off the ground. That is, if the abductors on this side contract, they will help in lifting this leg off the foot. So when these abductors contract with intact abductors, the individual can raise one leg, that is the opposite leg, off the ground. This is what is called as Trendelenburg test negative. That is, when these abductors contract, they elevate the hip joint so that the opposite leg goes off the ground. With damaged abductors, the individual cannot raise the leg off the ground. This is what is called as the Trendelenburg positive test. Next, we come to the fracture of the neck of femur. The fracture of the neck of femur is a fairly common condition in elderly due to osteoporosis and even trivial incidents like misstepping can cause a fracture of the neck. It is not common in the younger age group because the younger age group have relatively much stronger bones. However, there can occur a fracture of the neck of the femur in the younger aged people due to high energy impacts as a result of racing events, skiing, trampoline, soccer, rugby, all these in injuries with high energy impacts can result in a traumatic fracture of the neck of the femur in the younger age group. The fracture of the neck of the femur could be extracapsular or intracapsular and it is very important to remember that the intracapsular uh, fractures of the neck of fever can result in an avascular necrosis to the head of the femur. The realignment of fractured segments is difficult. It has to be done with internal fixations with plates and nails and the recovery is problematic and difficult. It requires a lot of rehabilitation and physiotherapy. So that is about the fracture of the neck of femur in the elderly versus the younger age group. Necrosis of the femoral head in children can sometimes occur in which the superior femoral epiphysis separates out from the neck. This occurs as a result of traumatic dislocations and what happens is there is an incongruity of the joint surfaces. The growth at the epiphysis is retarded and this is especially common in children of the age group 3 to 9 years of age and with the resultant hip pain which is radiating to the knee with a permanent shortening of the limb and a pronounced limp which is present. The hip joint is a strong and a stable joint but however is subject to osteoarthritic changes. Chronic osteoarthritis can result in pain, edema, restriction of movements and erosion of the joint cartilage. In advanced cases of chronic osteoarthritis, the only treatment would be the replacement of the hip. This is a clinical procedure in which the femoral head and neck are replaced by a metal prosthesis. So this part is removed and is replaced by a metal prosthesis and a high polymer plastic cup is cemented into the hip bone which replaces the acetabulum. So you have an artificially reconstructed hip joint which is made up of a high polymer plastic cup here and a metal prosthesis which, which functions as the head of the femur. With this, we now come to the end of the lesson and we will have a quick review of what we have studied in this lesson so far. We have seen the type of the joint which is the hip joint is a ball and socket type of multi-axial synovial joint. The articulating bones include the acetabulum of the hip bone and the head of the femur. The ligaments which reinforce the hip joint include the capsular ligament which attaches the acetabulum to the uh, neck of the femur. Then the strong ligaments which support the hip joint include the iliofemoral ligament, the ischiofemoral ligament, the pubofemoral ligament. The smaller ligaments which are in the hip joint include the transverse ligament of the acetabulum and the ligament of the head of the femur. We have seen the relations in which the flexors are placed anteriorly, the extensors and lateral rotators are placed posteriorly, the medial rotators and abductors are placed superiorly and the adductors are placed antero-inferiorly. We have seen the blood supply to the head of the femur and the joint capsule is coming from mostly the medial circumflex femoral arteries. Some amount of blood supply comes from the lateral circumflex femoral arteries and uh, in small percentage of cases, the blood is coming from the obturator artery which is running along the ligament of the head of the femur. The nerve supply is by articular branches which are coming from the femoral nerve, the sciatic nerve, the obturator nerve and the nerve to obturator internus.
We have seen the three sets of movements which occur at the hip joint. This include flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, medial rotation, and lateral rotation. We have seen the various muscles which cause these different sets of movements. We have seen the various aspects of applied anatomy which include the posterior dislocations of the hip joint, the anterior dislocations of the hip joint, the congenital dislocations of the hip joint which are more common in the uh, females. We have seen the various type of fractures, fractures which involve the neck of the uh, head of neck of the femur. We have also seen how the head of the femur is prone to avascular necrosis and finally we had a brief look at the total hip replacement surgery. With this we come to the end of this lesson on the hip joint. Thank you very much.